Eris Pappas uh, retired from the Central Intelligence Agency in 2003 as a member of the Senior Intelligence Service. His CIA work centered on analysis of the Soviet military. He was the Assistant National Intelligence Officer for General Purpose Forces during the first Gulf War, providing daily briefings to the entire membership of Congress. He later became the chief of the CIA's Soviet, Threat, uh, Soviet Theater Forces Division. In addition to his analytic assignments, Mr. Pappas served on rotation to the FBI, attended the centennial class of the U.S. Navy War College, played a key role in continuity of government operations post-911, and worked closely with one of the CIA's most highly regarded human sources. He served uh, on the uh, DNI's Intelligence Community Strategic Studies Group and taught a postgraduate course on intelligence and on intelligence and war at Johns Hopkins University. He co-founded Intelligence Enterprises LLC, where he served on the Kerr Commission, the first investigation and critique of the performance of intelligence prior to the start of the war with Iraq. Mr. Pappas later served as senior director of the Microsoft Institute for Advanced Technology and Government. He is a commercial instrument rated pilot, an avid scale modeler, and currently volunteering as a docent at the National Air and Space Museum. Eris. Want to turn this on? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. So after all of that, most of which was true, my parents would say, so you're speaking in a brewery. <laughs> my mother would say it with slight negative tone. My father would say, so you're speaking in a brewery. <laughs> You can't escape your past. Oh, is this going to work? I have booming problems. No, I think that. No? Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about Richard Kuklinski, who I've got labeled up there as a Cold War hero. But before that, I want to talk about what he did generically. Okay? The man was an agent for the United States. He provided secret material to the United States that the opposition was trying to withhold from us. It's what they call human, human intelligence. Now most of the people associated with the Cold War and this U-2 here and the SR-71s are basically responsible for objective material that comes out of technical sources. But what you need to understand is the role of human. Human provides you with the distinction between knowing something and understanding something. You can take a picture of something with a U-2 or an SR-71. You can take a picture or you can listen to something on the telephone, but it doesn't necessarily provide you with an understanding of why that thing is happening. We can watch a unit move from one place to the other. We can watch a unit dissolve itself. We can charge it, watch it re-equip. We can follow it through training. As a matter of fact, the reality is, and I'm sure some Cold War speaker will speak to that, we had the Soviets pretty much wired for light, sound, heat, smell, and things like that. They were a terribly penetrated target. But always a key to this was why were they doing what they were doing. And pretty much the only way that you can figure out why something is happening is to talk to the person who's doing it, or was involved, or was at the table. It's not enough to steal the plans. You can have the plans and understand, okay, they're going to come through this valley and they're going to turn right when they get up to that mountaintop. Why did they choose to go that way? What options did they reject? Why did they reject the options that they rejected? These are not things that you can take a photograph of. These are not things that you can pull out of ether by simply listening to a, a, a message. They are a basic clue into the area of mysteries because intelligence officers, whenever you look at this in the newspaper and say intelligence says this, intelligence says that, always remember that you're dealing with two different kinds of material. One is secrets and the other one is mysteries. Secrets are things to which there are answers. If I could obtain access to that thing, it is no longer a secret to me. So if I was looking to see what the capacity of a, a MiG-25's fuel tanks are, it's not something I could simply observe, but if I got my hands on the right set of papers, I would know, because it's a secret. What I would not know is how well is the training going. What I would not know is how well are they going to use that system. What I would not know is how are they integrating it into their, to the rest of their forces. I would not understand their concept of operations. Concepts and understanding are the kinds of... Hello. Oh, I'm burping. <laughs> yeah, 
concepts and things like that are the sorts of stuff that human agents can provide you. And Colonel Kuklinski was a premier agent. I would argue that, especially for the Cold War era, so that we don't have to get into things like Nathan Hale and people like that, he was one of the top two or three agents ever to have worked for the United States. Now, you may have heard of places, people like Penkovsky or Popov. Those were Russians, and they provided us with information pertaining to the Soviet military as, to, as when it comes to the uh, question of nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles. What Kuklinski was, was a colonel on the Polish general staff who was assigned to the Warsaw Pact headquarters in Warsaw. And so therefore, his insights were the insights into the, central, the war in Central Europe. It was an insight into the way a non-nuclear or even a theater level nuclear war would be conducted between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about, is what the man was able to accomplish and how he did it. Now, first of all, I'd like to speak and make sure I discuss his motivations. When you're dealing with human agents, you're dealing mostly with two kinds of people. People who are philosophically inclined to help you. They are opposed to the, to the Soviet Union. They are opposed to communism. They are opposed to fascism. These are people who are willing to give their lives and spend their lives in pursuit of an idealistic objective. Once you get your hands on people like that, who, by the way, tend to turn themselves into you rather than you finding them, they seek opportunities to perform this work because they're motivated. Once you get those kinds of people, you can pretty much trust what they're going to do from then on because they're self-motivated. Now, there's another kind of spy, and he makes much more interesting reading in a book and much more interesting uh, uh, films on TV and, and the movies, and that's a guy who's in it for compensation. And he's going to sell me what he knows about the Warsaw Pact General Stamp but only at $10,000 a page. That's okay. I'll pay the $10,000. We have to deal with those people. Intelligence people have to deal sometimes with the scum of the earth. No. <laughs> Not you, really. You're just filling in. Okay. <laughs> just scum of the earth. We accept Okay. <laughs> But you see, the problem with him is he's going to take my $10,000, but next week if he comes in and says, I give you 15, he's gone. And he's going to do it that way. But if he was there for ideological reasons, you can't offer him anything because what he's looking for is in his head. What he's looking for is his sense of freedom. And this is exactly what, what, uh, what uh, Colonel Kuklinski was looking for. He was convinced, absolutely, and he was absolutely right, that the Polish people and that the Polish nation was occupied by the Soviet Union. They were not allies in the sense of NATO. They were not allies in the sense of being able to share in the decision making. And for every good reason that we could possibly document, the Soviets were treating this, the, the uh, Eastern Europeans as basically fodder. Fodder for a war that the East Europeans didn't necessarily want to have to fight. But would if they had to. But would if they had to. That's an important point. It wasn't as if the Poles and the East Germans and the Czechs would just simply walk away from the war. They, had, they were integrated into the Soviet plan for war in Central Europe, and they would have fought. Some of them better than others, admittedly, but they would have fought. And it's not something that just blow away. So Kuklinski was somebody who was vitally aware of, the, of the, this occupation by the Soviets. Now look, if you were in Warsaw and you, your shop was selling dresses, or your shop was selling apples and oranges and things like that. Your view of the Russians would even be very broad or very, very precise because they don't interfere with your life that much. It's not like there's a Soviet officer standing there watching you sell apples. On the other hand, if you're a general staff officer responsible and sworn to the safety and security of the Polish nation and the Polish heritage, you've got a Russian standing right over your shoulder all day long, all the time. And that Russian is there to make sure that you don't make any decisions and you don't write any plans that are not acceptable to the Soviet general staff. And we'll talk a little bit later about the wartime statute that they forced all the East Europeans to sign, which basically removed any, any even sense of sovereignty from the perspective of the relationship between the East Europeans and the, and the Soviets. So Kuklinski was witness to this occupation on a daily basis as a senior officer on the Warsaw Pact General Staff. The other thing he was witness to was a certain geographic reality. Can I have that first slide? Sure. If you look at this map, you can see where NATO is and you can see where uh, the Warsaw Pact is. The Warsaw Pact is in, I don't know what that is, gray, purple, mauve. 
puce. Uh, and the, the uh, NATO is in, NATO's in yellow, with a couple of white, uh, a couple of white neutrals in there: Switzerland, Austria, Yugoslavia, uh, and so on. But the important thing here is this: basically, the way that the, the war would have played out, the way the positioning was uh, before the war. Most of the U.S. forces were in the border between East Germany and West Germany. This is mountainous down here, so you're not, you're not going to see a lot of military operation. But this is the East German, East German, North, West German border was flat, the North German plain. It was conducive to armored operations and quick moves. The Soviets had lined up all of their forces along this line. The, European, the NATO forces were also opposite that line here. The French were out of it for the time being. The Belgian forces were up on the line. The Dutch forces were up on the line. The British were up here. Two US Army Corps, the 5th Corps and the 7th Corps, were up on that border. And they were facing the group of Soviet forces, Germany, plus five, 10 East German divisions, 22 Polish divisions, 10 Czechoslovakian divisions. I may have those numbers slightly wrong because I'm lousy with numbers. But basically, that's the way it played out. And in a, in a war in Europe, the assumption was that these forces here would start to move this way on a broad, on a length, on a, on a, uh, a, a, a an axis that shows like this. Okay, we would be there to defend them right at the line. The problem was this: behind the NATO forces, behind the forces that we had lined up here, back here, there was nothing. There were no reserves. Basically, the strategy was that if it got that bad, we'd use nuclear weapons. But we didn't really want to use nuclear weapons, and nobody was very happy about the idea of using nuclear weapons. It's just that there were no reserves. That was not true on the Soviet side of this equation. As I told you, up here were all the East German, Soviet uh, forces. The Polish forces always practiced moving this way. The Czech forces would come up. So you can see there's an arrow going this way, an arrow going that way, and right in the middle in the squeeze is the US Fifth Corps. So, they had these forces that were basically built to equate to the forces that NATO had on the Western axis. They were evenly matched, relatively evenly matched. It's got nothing to do with whether we'd win or they'd win. We're talking about sheer numbers now, sheer capability, uh, without all the, the soft things having to do with initiative and planning and things of that nature. But so they had their first strategic echelon here. We had our, we had our strategic defenses here. Back here, we had nothing. Problem was here. The problem was back here in the Western Soviet Union was a complete duplicate set of the forces that were up here. They had a whole set that was called the strategic second strategic echelon that would have moved on to Western Europe and basically forced us to have to make a decision to use nuclear weapons or succumb because the number would have been two to one in effect. It would have been worse than two to one. I, that's not a clean assumption, two to one. But the point is, we had no reserves. They had a complete second set coming through, uh, coming through to support the forces that were up here. Now, here's where Kuklinski's problem comes in, and the Poles problem came in. If these forces here in the Soviet Union stayed put, in other words, this war starts. There's confusion and battle taking place over here. Polish units have been moved up to back up the East German and the Soviet units. There are no more forces pretty much in Poland. These guys stay put. Where would we, where would we use nuclear weapons? They, we're not going to attack the Soviet Union because the war under that circumstance had not turned strategic yet. So there had been no intercontinental ballistic missile strikes on the United States. We hadn't struck Moscow. This was a war that was limited to the, to the Western Front in Europe. If that's the case and these guys didn't engage, hell, they could stay there all day long. And we figured we could take care of this first strategic echelon, we could win the war, and you know, we had our plans to do that. What happens if these guys start moving? Well, if they start moving, we've immediately got a problem because we've got nothing to stop them with. Right? The other problem is this. If we started to use nuclear weapons, which was our only fallback position, where would we use those nuclear weapons? Not here, because there's nothing to hit here anymore. They moved. 
The fact that they moved is what made this a problem. Those forces are all crossing Poland like this. All the roads in Poland run east and west, not all of them, but there's a tremendously intricate east-west road mechanism there that the Soviets put in so that they could get the second strategic echelon to bear on this, this attack. So if all the Soviet forces now have vacated their positions in the, in the USSR, they don't want, we don't want a nuclear attack on the USSR because the war has not gone strategic. All of those forces are crossing Poland. Where are the nukes going to go? Oh. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem for Poland. Because they were going to bear the brunt of the war in Central Europe. They were going to bear the nuclear brunt, certainly the, the first set of nuclear battles were going to occur in Poland on Polish access. Kuklinski understood this and all the rest of the Polish general staff understood this and there was nothing they could do about it because as far as the Soviets are concerned, this is not a big problem. It's Poland. Why did they have these countries as a buffer? They weren't really allies. They were fodder for the game. Okay? And as long as they could get that second strategic echelon up, they were going to be happy. And Kuklinski understood this and he did what he did basically to negate the advantage that the Soviets held in Central Europe. To negate the advantage of the second strategic echelon. To screw up their plans to such and such an extent that we might not have to use nuclear weapons and the Poles could slip out from under. This is a very dicey game, but you can see the geography. There's not much you can do to get around this. Those Soviet forces were going to be crossing Poland. When those forces crossed Poland, they had to be attacked. For those of you that are in the that were in the Air Force or are still in the uh, in the defense business, the fact of the matter is that this this problem that I just outlined for you, and I hope I made it clear, is the reason that we have what they call deep strike systems. This is what cruise missiles were designed to do: to take out those lines of communication, to take out the second strategic echelon crossing Poland. Deep strike with F-15Es, deep strike with the Navy coming out of the Bal out of the Baltic, deep strike with cruise missiles. And it's something that the Soviets were going to try and get out from under by moving as fast as they could across that line before we could bring our systems to bear. This is the world that Kuklinski populated. Okay. He was the guy who was writing the Soviet plans that was going to allow them to get this thing done. So what did he do? He tried to contact the United States when he was an officer in Saigon. I'll show you. I have some pictures that I'm going to show, but don't expect them until the end of the presentation. Just talk for now. And I'll show you some pictures to populate this later. Kuklinski was in Saigon. They had a, a, a peace commission going in Saigon. It was flying between Saigon and, and Hanoi. Uh, and they were, they were composed of Polish supposed neutrals, Poles and Indians and people like that. I can't remember all, who, the other countries that were involved. But they'd fly back and forth. And basically, it was a kabuki, but, but it was there ostensibly to be peace. He had himself assigned to that unit, okay? So as a Pole, he became part of the Polish contingent. While he was in Saigon, he tried to contact the American uh, uh, embassy, but it was too heavily guarded. He couldn't get through in a way that was safe for him to get to the Americans and offer his services. So his first attempt to reach us, which was in Saigon, failed. But he had another opportunity. The other opportunity was him as a sailor. He was an avid sailor. And he was allowed by the general staff once a year to take a sailing boat, a sailing ship, which, Eva, is named Ligia, interestingly enough. Uh, that's an inside thing. <laughs> but the sailboat was named Ligia. He was allowed to take several colonels from the general staff and make a trip once a year out into the western areas, Netherlands, Belgium, even as far down as, I don't think he got as far as France ostensibly, ostensibly, to collect intelligence information on these ports. The Hague, Rotterdam, Hamburg, Hanover, you know, all these things. Because what they're really after is we get out west and we can buy shit. <laughs> and they did. They just loaded up that boat with everything that their wives ever wanted, all the stuff from the west, booze, you know, everything that they could, and they'd bring it back. So this is, you know, none of you understand this because we don't have this problem in the West. This is a bunch of colonels on a free shot. So they all went out there, yes, yeah, smile. <laughs> they went out there and they just, they, they rampaged the place. They were like the Huns, you know. But he knew that he was going out there and he, he had an opportunity to contact. So what he did is he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to the U.S. Embassy in Bonn. And in that letter he offered his services. And then he left. Now, when they got this letter in Bonn, 
they had to be very careful with how they did it. Because remember we were talking earlier about people who are looking for money and what their motivations are and things like that. One of the things that could be happening is that the Soviets or the Poles by themselves are planting this information to see if anybody will show up and then they arrest them. It's a plant. Or the guy could be a double agent, which is even worse. And so they had to be very careful to understand just what was being offered to them and whether or not it was viable and useful to, to, the, to the war effort. The CIA, of course, was principal in doing this because the military did not have the facility to do it. It wasn't in their job job. Not that they couldn't do it, it wasn't in their job job. So they took a look at this and they decided after some heavy duty discussions, which would attend any offer like this, they decided to take a chance. Now he made a requirement in his letter. He said he wanted to meet with officers of the United States Army. It was clear he didn't want to talk to intelligence people, he wanted to talk to army people peer to peer. He was a general staff officer after all. And in Europe, general staff means a whole lot. That's another whole briefing. But if you're in the general staff in the European army, uh, it's, it's very significant. We, we don't have one in the United States because it's illegal. Uh, interestingly enough, whole story there. Uh, anyway, he, he knew that, that he could make this offer. The U they decided at the, uh, at, the, at the embassy and in Washington that they would put two officers, two CIA officers, in U.S. Army uniforms, and they would meet with Kuklinski at the date and place that he had designated in his, in his letter. So they showed up uh, as Colonel so-and-so and Lieutenant Colonel so-and-so, and they had a chat with Kuklinski. Kuklinski's offer, you know, he, this is his next time out in the boat. When you're dealing with humans, it's not like the SR, it's not like U2s, it's not like dealing with technical issues. You want that signal? We snap it on the we snap it on the radio and boom, that signal's coming in because we've tuned into that frequency. When you're talking to an agent, you may not talk to that agent except in annual intervals when he's out because it's very hard to talk to somebody in Moscow, very hard to get together and chat because everybody's being followed. They're under suspicion. And if the guy is really valuable, you don't want to waste the value of that person simply to have a chit-chat. So frequency of, of opportunity is zero almost in, in, in Eastern European and the Soviet Union at the time, and probably still today. So they had to decide what to do to get together with him. They did that, uh, and the first thing he did was offer a coup. He knew that there were other Polish officers who thought and, and acted like he did, and he felt that he could motivate them into performing some sort of a coup and turn the polls over and so on and so forth. Needless to say, this was a suicidal idea. Right? It just was not going to happen, not going to work. The Russians were all over the place. And for that matter, the polls who were on the general staff, for the most, many of them, were benefiting from being on that staff. They had gone to communist schools and whatnot. They were, they were hardliners. They understood. They, they, they were getting the benefits of this, so they would defend it. So the idea of the CIA basically said, no thanks. We, we don't need that. So he said, well, what else can I do? We said, if you really want to undermine the Soviet war plans and the Soviet intentions for attacks in Central Europe, you can act as an agent for us, provide us with information, and so on. Kuklinski agreed to do this, and that was the beginning of his, of his career. He, uh, what did he do? He went back to Poland. Obviously, he took the ship. Oh, by the way, CIA, we're all purpose firm. Okay, so when he left the hotel room where the meeting was, was, he had provided us with a list of all the things that he was going to buy for his wife. So some poor CIA guy had to run around in the Hague, which is where the first meeting occurred, buy all the stuff that he was going to buy for his wife so that when Kuklinski returned to the boat and all the other colonels showed up with the booty that they'd collected, he had his pile of booty there too, as if he'd spent the afternoon shopping. Of course, he'd spent the afternoon working for freedom. Uh, but he carried all this stuff back and, and back it went. So the, all these little things have to be considered. Back he went. What did he do when he got back? He started looking through all the information that he had access to. And he had access to a lot of information. He was the ops officer for the Warsaw Pact. He was the operations officer for the largest military unit which subsumed all the Soviets. All the, remember, all of those forces I told you, the Warsaw Pact, Poland, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, the Soviets, um, what am I leaving out? Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, okay, all parts of the Warsaw Pact, all had officers on the Warsaw Pact staff. But the Poles were pretty close to the Russians. 
mostly because of geography and, and otherwise because of the importance of their military supply system which ran across the country. So he was involved in all the intense Soviet war planning. Additionally, he was involved in other things that the Russians tried to do, like sell them airplanes and things like that. The Russians are unconscionable. They were trying to sell MiG-21s when you couldn't even give them away to Arabs anymore. Uh, but they tried to get these people in the Warsaw Pact to buy them. Sir? What time frame talking about? Talking about 1970s. He started working, his first, he first came out uh, and started doing this about 1970s, so the rough period of time, and I was going to just get to the, to the length of time, but thank you for setting it. Uh, basically, he started looking through all this information that's coming across his desk, and when he saw something that he thought would be of strategic significance, in other words, worth his life, to, to send to us, he would put it in a bag and bring it home with him. You know how risky that is? Think about it for a minute. Think about it. He would put this top secret stuff in a bag, take it home with him, and then when he got home, he would get into a chair, hold the chair, go chair backwards, and then he would put the, the document on the ground. Then he'd kneel on the chair and use the Minox camera that the CIA provided him at the last personal meeting that they had, and he'd take a picture of page one. He'd get off the chair, turn the page, go to page two, get up back on the chair, take a picture. In this fashion, Kuklinski provided something like, over the course of a 10-year career, he worked from 1970 to 1980, basically, okay, for a 10-year period. He provided over 35,000 top secret Soviet and Warsaw Pact documents. This is not trivial stuff that's going to the, hand, to the trash. This is the war plans for the Warsaw Pact. We had it all, okay, and Kuklinski was the one that provided it. And because he was working for us, because he was a general staff officer, because he had been trained at the Voroshilov Staff Academy, he'd spent time in Moscow being trained to be a staff officer. Again, not a trivial thing. He had the ability to not only send us the plans, but also to send us his comments on the plans and say, this is why this route was chosen. This is why this decision was made. This is why we decided to buy this, but not to buy that. Because this thing has a, a problem with it that all the Warsaw Pact guys know about. You may not know about it, but here it is. In other words, he was reporting to us on that understanding level. And we were able to use his material as a Rosetta Stone that helped us understand the things that we were taking a picture of. My good friend Buzz can fly over an area and take a picture of a, of a unit, and he, we could learn enormous amounts of information about that unit just by looking at the picture. We could learn what their order of battle is. We could learn where they, you know, when they've updated to a new kind of tank. We could even determine if the picture is really good, whether or not they've changed the size of the gun in the tank. But what we don't have from Buzz's picture is why they do it. And what, are the, what were their options? Did they have any options other than the one that they chose? Why did they choose it? Why they didn't? I'll get back, I, I explained that to you earlier. Kuklinski was in a unique position to be able to do that. Yes, ma'am? How did he transfer that information? I can't hear you. I, I, how did he transfer that information? If you're saying to us, you know, can, can you? How did he transfer, he transfer those, that information back to us? You earned every bit of the five bucks that I gave you before to ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you. But, but I'm going to check my notes first and see if that puts me out of order. Okay, but I will get to that because it's a cool part of the story. Why? It happens to be the very next thing on my mouth. <laughs> At the beginning, what he would do is use something called a dead drop system. Now you've seen dead drops on TV, you've seen it on movies and whatnot, but here's how a dead drop works. At the meetings with the CIA, which would occur annually or thereabouts, when he was out of the country and was relatively safe to have these meetings, what they would do is spend their time asking and answering questions that weren't immediately clear in the material that he'd sent us, but also handling administrative kinds of things like, how are you going to get this stuff out to us? And the way they would do it is this. He takes these pictures with the Minox camera, okay? Then he takes the roll of film, in this one case, and it's outlined in a book that I'm going to talk to you about in, 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 later, uh, he takes this, uh, this film from the Minox camera, puts it in a, um, a container, takes the container and slips it into a glove. Now this is a little roll of film, you know, puts it in the glove. Then he greases up the glove, because he doesn't want the glove to look too com compelling, you know, for somebody. 
Then he goes out and he drives around in Warsaw for an hour or so, watching his rearview mirror to see if anybody's following him. This is called a, uh, uh, a uh, personal surveillance. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, he's looking to see if he's been tailed, but it's a surveillance route that he's running. Okay? And if he decides that he's clear, he stops at a place and drops this can of film off. And then he goes back and he puts a chalk mark someplace, which has been understood. And if the chalk mark is a check, it means that the mailbox is loaded. Okay? A CIA person is driving past that place once a day. The CIA person sees the check mark and chalk, chalk and drives around some more, boy, you know, gets the rest of the day done and whatnot. But later that evening, he's going to stop by the dead drop to pick up the mailbox. Now, here's the deal. The deal is this. You never use a dead drop more than once. It's, it's asking for trouble. You know, why this person go to the same place twice? And so what, one of the things that happens at the annual meetings is they make a decision as to what the next 12 dead drops are going to be. So that he's got a dead drop for January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, like that. And he knows that at the end of May, or the end of January, he's going to use that dead drop and put film into that dead drop, okay? And then when he puts the marked signal on, they look at the calendar and they say, okay, it's, it's January, it must be dead drop number one, okay? Then he collects more information, takes more pictures, roll, more rolls of film, more gloves, okay? And it's now February, and he takes it to February's dead drop, drops it off, puts a check mark out, and they say, okay, it's February, we know we're gonna go pick up the dead drop in February. The problem was, he was so damn prolific that he, in, on January 10th, he used up that dead drop. But he had some hot stuff that he needed to report to us, and it was still January. It doesn't matter. He goes to the next dead drop, and he puts the next check mark on. The CIA person says, okay, that's the second dead drop, and he goes here. And so February is now burned. The third month, in the first week of February, he's already into March. By the time you get to the second week in March, he's already in April. And now he's in June, okay, and it's still March in reality. What's the problem here? What happens in Warsaw in the winter that doesn't happen in the summer? Snow. So this dead drop that he was using, for example, it's the opposite way I described it to you, summer into the winter. He, he was dropping this thing off at a place where he could, he could re relatively assure that the CIA person would find it. But along comes snow and covers up the, the glove, which is one of the reasons it's all greasy, because in Poland, even a one glove is a good, good catch for the day. <laughs> Seriously. So he had to grease it up so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be compelling to anybody. He gets that, and he, he you know, lashes it up. Then, it, then they come around and they say, oh, we've got to go service, service this dead drop. The problem is he's already burnt out these other dead drops, and so snow is falling. What else happens when there's snow? Snow plows. <laughs> So here's what happens. He takes the roll of, of film, and he drives around, determines that nobody's following him, skids off the road and hits a lamppost. He gets out of the car, runs around to the side of the car that's now hidden from the road, and searches, you know, looks at the fender to make sure it hasn't been completely destroyed and whatnot. But in the meantime, he takes the roll of film out with the glove and sticks it under the lamppost base. Throws a little bit of snow back over it, gets back in his car and drives away. A little while later, the CIA person sees the check mark and says, okay, the dead drop is full, the one by the lamppost. Later that night, CIA person driving along, and he'd been driving for an hour or so because, you know, they're checking to see if anything's on there. He skids into, well, wouldn't you know, the same damn lamppost. <laughs> now, this is a problem with security. Security is based on the individual. If they were following Kuklinski and they were later, somebody else was following the, the CIA officer, they wouldn't be able to put two and two together because nobody's watching the damn lamppost. If the focus was on the lamppost, they'd say two cars in the same day. No, no. And they would have stripped everything around there to see what was there. But that's not the way it works. The way it works is purely coincidentally, nobody, nobody who was watching the CIA guy later that afternoon has a report from somebody earlier in the day that Colonel Kuklinski or one of the officers from the general staff hit the same lamppost. There's no way for that information to be transferred. So basically, he was way ahead of himself in creating a problem. The CIA person, though, is still meeting those, still using those de that dead drops, so he picks up the folk, the film skids into the same lamppost, 
He's looking around at his fender, and now he's reaching into the snow plowed snow. Now, in Poland, that's not a great idea. In any big city, you know, you can find a lot more than just a glove with film in it, you know. Anyway, so you get paid to do this stuff. So down he goes, he finds the glove, finds the film. The film goes back with him to his apartment that night. Why? Because if he goes back to the embassy, that would be alerting. Because normally you don't go back to your embassy after you've left for the evening. So back he goes, sleeps with the film. The next day it's brought into the embassy. And one way or another that I'm not going to describe, it gets sent back to the United States. In, his, in this case, he knew that he was, behind, he was using up a dead drop that he was going to need again. But he had to do it because the information was critical information that had come across his desk concerning the position that the Soviets were going to take on an arms control agenda that was coming up later in that week. And so literally, quite literally, the information that Kuklinski sent that night ended up on the president's desk the next morning. And that's important stuff. That's what you can do with a human agent, is you can get that kind of information out if he's got the system set up for it. Now, I told you that this happened, for, he did this for 10 years, 35,000 documents. Not all of them were transferred that way. Later on in his career, during the late toward the, the late, much later, so late 78, 79, they developed uh, you know, an electronic means for him to be able to transfer information and to send messages and receive messages. But this was really, really not to be used on a daily basis because everybody, I don't care what country it is, the United States, the Soviet Union, China, Uganda, the Central Africa, they all have electronic devices that are looking for other electronic devices. And so you don't want things going out there in the middle of the street by a lamppost going beep, beep, beep. Why is that lamppost beeping? That's, that's wrong, you know. And so they're going to go look. So you don't use this stuff as often as you might think. The movies really suck. I mean, they don't, the only movie I've ever seen that made any sense in terms of the pace of intelligence operations is Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Nobody gets shot. You don't have these old men running through an alley with a 9 millimeter pistol. You know, it's ridiculous. Uh, but but the, the tension involved and the, the, the motivations that are involved are very real. So I, I recommend that movie for what it's worth. Now, I told you he did this for 10 years. Okay, so here's where I challenge you for a second. We've all seen the born, ex the born experiment, the born this, the born supremacy, the born birth. You know, I don't know James Bond. You know, traveling first class, surrounded by women, sleeping in suites. You know, <laughs> <laughs> not real. Just think of the United States government, and you got the right answer right there. <laughs> it's not true. But here's here's the thing. We become inured to this stuff, right? We watch these guys on TV and in the movies and all that, you know, and they're all flying around, you know, with blondes hanging off of them, you know, and, oh, it's just amazing, okay? But the reality is, every single day for 10 years, every single day for 10 years, every knock on the door could be the KGB. Literally, every knock on the door for a 10 year period. Close your eyes for a second and just imagine that. Because like I said, all of us, me too, you know, I mean, I'm in this racket, but you know, you, 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 hey, the Bourne conspiracy, yeah, you know, and swing on a rope from one building to the other across the street, you know. And, and the reality is this man is sitting there with, with papers on the floor of his desk, of his, of his living room in an apartment in Warsaw, that if anybody saw, they would kill him. And in fact, there was one episode where he came as close as you could possibly come when what happened was he, he was carrying some exceptionally classified material out and he was hit, uh, he hit a lamppost on his way out the door uh, and papers flew out everywhere. If anybody had looked at the papers that had fallen out, they would have arrested him because even his friends would have arrested him because they couldn't tell it wasn't a provocation. They would have had to do something, but, and so they, they let it, but they, they didn't look at the papers. They said, oh, Richard did, almost broke his nose, he's bleeding. They put his papers together, stuffed them back in his valise, and brought it to him at the hospital. I mean, you know, when you're lucky, you're lucky. Now, that's serious, and that's, that was Kuklinski's answer to me. So what happens is, he comes out after a certain period of time. I should tell you that he receives no compensation for the whole period that he's in Poland. 
He, he did not wish any compensation. He felt that he was a patriot uh, and would be insulted at the idea that anybody would pay him. And so the CIA, in cases like that, holds the information in escrow, holds the, in, the payment in escrow in the event that a man has, ever has to come out. If he never comes out, he never gets a penny. Seriously. As it turns out, he ended up having to come out. I told you about his impact. I told you that, that uh, he had tremendous impact on, on military forces, uh, deep strike systems and whatnot. He was also responsible for showing us the Warsaw Pact statute, which was a statute that the Russians made the East European sign, which indicated that at the command of the Soviet general staff, all military forces in these, country, in these uh, Warsaw Pact nations would come under the direct command of the Soviet general staff. In other words, the Polish forces would no longer be responsible to the Polish government. The German forces would no longer be responsible to the German government, such as it was, or Bulgaria, or Hungary, or Czech Czechoslovakia. They would become vassals. They would become part and parcel of the command structure of the general staff. That's called basic sovereignty. That's basic sovereignty. And the Soviets just ripped it apart. So he gave us all of that. But something else started to happen about that time. Around 1980, this thing happened called Solidarity. Solidarity was a mo movement by uh, the Poles uh, in a labor form with Lech Walesa to basically overturn, that basically threatened the, this, the, the Soviet-dominated uh, government in Poland. The Soviets didn't like it. They wouldn't abide by this. Why? They couldn't have that purple part in the middle between their second echelon and the front with a neutral NATO nation, or neutral or worse NATO nation in between. So they got together with the Poles and said, look, you do something about this or we will. And everybody understood what we will means, because they had done it before. In 1953, they invaded Germany. In 1956, they invaded Hungary. 1968, they invented Czechoslovakia. The circumstances were identical to the Polish problem that was emerging in 1980. The Soviets told the Poles, we're going to invade you and crush solidarity unless you do something about it. The short story is that he decided, they decided that they would impose martial law, arrest all the leaders of solidarity, and basically crush the, the labor movement. Okay? So they get together and they, they, the, the general staff is put in charge of putting together this martial law plan, which is incredibly complicated. I mean, if you don't have the military take over a government, there's a lot of things that have to be taken into account. Communications, electronics, power, you know, payment, everything, you know, everything. everything. Guess who they put in charge of writing the martial law plan? Kuklinski. So Kuklinski now starts to send messages back to us with each iteration of the martial law plan being written and sent to us. I become the analyst responsible for analyzing that material. Now, previously, all this material went to various different people because the air, air stuff went to the air guys, Navy stuff went to the Navy guys, operation stuff went to the You know, to each according to their needs in terms of of, uh, of operational necessity in the CIA. This time I was told by my boss, you're the martial law guy, so from now on, you're going to make sure you read all the stuff he's given us. Now, because by this time he had electronic transmittal, some of the stuff would come in in the middle of the night, and I'd get a phone call and have to go into the CIA and read it. He, uh, you know, I could not read Polish, but we had translators that could do it very well. So I would sometimes get the information before the Polish president. And the reason for that is that if Kuklinski stayed up late working on a modification, went back to his apartment, sent it over to us in the United States, but the next day, Jaroszelski, who was the premier in Poland, had a rough schedule and he wasn't going to be able to read the updates until late in the afternoon or early evening. That stuff has already been in Washington for eight hours. That's pretty damn cool. I mean, yeah. So we screw things up every once in a while. It's true, we're human. But when you get it right, it's very cool. Okay? Yes, sir. Going back to where you were about the knock on the door, yeah. Would in Poland, would KGB make that knock, or would it be? Polish? No, there's a Polish, there's a Polish, uh, there's a Polish equivalent to the KGB, but it would be working with the KGB like this, so it makes no difference. It, it's the same thing. You end up with the KGB, and at the end of the day, you're having a bad day. Uh, <laughs> So he's sending me all of this stuff, and we're, we're laying out all of this, this material, and I'm understanding it, so it's, it's my task. So what happens? All of a sudden, I get a phone call from my boss, who says, I want you to come into my office. 
So I come in and I said, I want you to do an SDR, a surveillance detection group. And I said, in Washington, in Northern Virginia, you want me to drive around like this? I said, I'm not in Warsaw or Moscow. Drive around for an hour and a half or two, and then at the end of that, if nobody's obviously following you, I want you to go to this address. When you get there, you'll know what to do. It's the closest thing to melodrama that I could possibly give you. So I did it. I drove around. You know, I had a nice car. It's a nice day. You know, they weren't paying for my gas. Remember, this is the government, right? But, but I'm driving around for a couple hours, and I go to this apartment. That apartment was an office suite. Knock on the door, and this gorilla comes out. I mean, I'm big, but this guy was like big. You know, and like, yes. I was like, oh. I'm just a little old analyst, and I was told to, yeah, come in. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I walk into this smoke-filled room, and I mean smoke-filled. And there were these two older guys sitting at a table, plus the security guy. The old, one of the older guys looks at me, and I, you know, I don't know exactly what's going on. He said, obviously something's happened. And he says, did you get the report I sent last week on the change to the communications package? The report that he sent last week. Holy mackerel, this is the agent. Now you gotta understand, analysts don't get to see agents. And for good reason, there's no reason for them to. It's not safe, it could lead to exposure, but here's this guy who's obviously the agent. And believe me, this material that he sent us was very, very, very closely held. Okay. I said, oh my God, yes. And the, third, the second guy there was a translator. And so we started talking. And I stayed there for hours talking to the guy about the martial law plan. That night, what he told me that evening, just to give you an idea of the value of these people, what he told me that evening, that afternoon was so important that I went back to the office after suitably driving around in Northern Virginia, and went to my boss and I told him what I had been told by Kuklinski. That night I wrote for the first time and only time in a 34 year career what they call a red striper. A red striper is a piece of paper that doesn't wait for the next morning's edition of the, New York, the President's Daily Brief. It gets put in a car and taken to the President now. Right now, now. And that's what, exactly what I did. I wrote one that gave up this information that Kuklinski had just given me, and as a result, the United States was in a much better position when the polls eventually imposed martial law. How did he get out? This is a cool story. Um, he lasted 10 years, which is an eternity in this business. It's an absolute eternity in this business. Providing us with incredibly important information that you couldn't get from any place else. Then one day, he walks into the, to the office of the chief of the general staff, okay, a guy named Skalski. This is the Polish general staff. And it's a long table. The general is sitting at the head of the table, and there's chairs down the length of the table. You know, a typical bureaucratic, you know, coffee table type, uh, not coffee, group, not conference table type thing. And the general starts off, he says, gentlemen, I have terrible news. According to our friends, the, the, according to our friends, the information, the plans for martial law are in the hands of the people at Langley. And now, according to our friends means the KGB. KGB had provided them with information that through their sources, they'd learned that the Americans had gotten their hands on the martial law plans. And they knew that it were at CIA because they never said CIA, they'd say Langley. That's the way they just did it. Okay. Now, if you're in a room with Colonel, Colonel, General, General, Colonel, General, Colonel, which is the general staff of the Soviet Union, of the Poles, everybody in the room gets pissed off. Oh my God, this is terrible, we get a spy, it's, you know, we can't buy that. Now, if you're the guy who's actually the spy, you can imagine what kind of day you're having. Seriously, think about it. You know, everybody else knows it's not them. They're not happy that it's happening. But you know, hey, it's not me. I didn't do it. But the guy who did it. Whoop. So I talked to Kuklinski at length about this because it's how life or death is teeter tottering on a non decision. The general finished making his little presentation about how horrible it was that this, this leak occurred. And he said, Now I want to hear from you. Kuklinski was to his left, another general was to his right. There was no order to which they sat in the room. There was no order that he normally used to ask for points. If he had gone to his left, which is where Kuklinski was sitting, Kuklinski told me he was not yet prepared to deal with this. He would have run out and tried to jump out the window or grab somebody's gun and shoot himself. Because he wasn't going to put up with what the KGB was going to do with him. 
So he told me several times, because I was fascinated by this non-decision and how much it has to do with life. His whole life was dependent on whether the general went to his left or went to his right. He went to his right. And so the general over here says, now nah, we'll get the son of a bitch and we'll hang him from a tree. Oh, very good. Next guy. We're all going to get the son of a bitch and hang him from a tree. Next guy. We're all going to get the son of a bitch and hang him from a tree. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. By the time they got to Plinsky, guess what he said? We're all going to get the son of a bitch and hang him from a tree. Because he had a moment to compose himself. So he composed himself. He got straight. And basically, the meeting broke up because they didn't know who was the, was the leaker. They didn't know it was definitely one of the people in the room. Uh, their assumption could have been as a clerk. You know, and they just don't know. They just knew it was happening. So he goes out and hits the signal that says, get me out of here, me and my family. He had two teenage boys, his wife and himself. The CIA managed to exfiltrate his wife, the two teenage boys, and himself out from Poland, under surveillance, through East Germany, through Ber East Berlin, across Step Point Chalet, into the American zone in Berlin, whereupon he was flown by a U.S. Air Force C-5 to, to uh, Andrews Air Force Base, and met by CIA security at the Air Force Base. It's a whole story there, it's kind of funny. Um, the, the Air Force knew that this was an important passenger, but they didn't know who. Meanwhile, the case officer who was running this whole thing, Dave Ford, was there. And this Air Force Lieutenant Colonel tried to get the case officer to leave the tarmac because there was a secure person coming in. And Dave basically told him, your, your next job is going to be in the Aleutians. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he won, you know, he made his point. Uh, once Kuklinski came out, uh, we continued to use him as if he was still in place because the next best thing to having a person on the general staff is having a person who just left the general staff. It's going to take him a long time to think of things in Western forms. <clears throat> Oddly enough, as a military officer, he believed that the Soviets would win. And so when we took Linsky out to talk to American general officers, which I did frequently, it was a shock to them to talk to this professional officer who obviously had thrown his life bet in with the US and the West, but who when you talked about the professional aspects of a campaign in Central Europe, felt that numbers were gonna overcome everything and that the Soviets were going to beat him. So one American general said, we're going to land a Marine division on the Baltic coast, that part of East Germany there, right under the B in Baltic Sea. What would happen? Kuklinski said, probably nothing for two or three days. And the American was shocked. The Marine division is a huge investment of force. And so they said, you know, how could that be? He said, well, it would take us two or three days to know that you were there. And then after we knew you were there, we would detach two or three tank armies to keep you on the beach and then proceed with the rest of our campaign. And the number of people that they had was just stupendous. Now, we believe that we we're going to knock off those people because we had the capability of doing that. He didn't understand the capabilities of our technology. He didn't understand the nature of our war planning and which initiative has a great deal to do with it. Their view of it was you make a big plan for big, big forces and nothing can withhold, can withstand it. That's a, a, an argument for much later in another time. Sir? What month was the Exfiltration. What month? It's a good question. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember. I have to look that up. Okay. Why? 1980 81 was a very interesting time in the US Soviet relations. Right. It would be interesting to know whether or not his information affected stuff. Absolutely did. Yeah, I'm glad you asked me. Absolutely did. His information had everything to do with, with basically demarching the Soviets and preventing an invasion or an a further military occupation of Poland. Not only that, but it, it forced them to deal with solidarity in a different fashion. They still tried to rip it. They did impose martial law in January of 1981, 80 or 81. Uh, but they didn't do all the things that they might have done had there been no forewarning or exposure. Eventually, solidarity became uh, one, you know, came out on top. Uh, so Valencia was the president. However, interestingly enough, um, he was not exonerated. In 1984, the Polish government, which was still communist in 1984, uh, sentenced Kuklinski to death in absentia. Uh, later on, when the Soviet, when the communist Polish system collapsed, the new Polish government, including the one that's there, uh, you know, which is now there, but there's politics going on, um, basically uh, petitioned to join NATO. 
The United States and the former President Clinton and Spigny Brzezinski said, first Polish officer in NATO is already here in the United States. You have him under a death sentence unless you vacate that and the country is not going to join NATO. So we held NATO appointment for Poland over their heads until they exonerated uh, Kuklinski. And we were not willing to have the sentence reduced. We were not willing to do that at all. What we insisted was that the, that the Poles expunge the record, that there be no charge. Not that he'd be found innocent of a charge, no charge. And they, they you know, hemmed and hawed about that because they didn't like being pushed around too bad. And we said, you want to join NATO? This is, the, this is what's going to have to happen. And they did. They had a, a, uh, an investigation that included people coming to the United States, interviewing Kuklinski, me, and others, you know. Uh, and then eventually they went back and made the, the decision, no kidding, that we're going, to, we're going to expunge the record. So Kuklinski goes back to Poland two or three times in his life. Uh, as an honored guest, he becomes an honorary citizen of Krakow and Lvov. Uh, he becomes uh, a friend of some of the leadership in Poland. Uh, he's considered a hero. Last thing, I know we're running late here. Uh, yeah, keep going. Keep going. He, he gets back to Poland, and uh, you'd think that he would be considered one of two things, a hero or a traitor. He would be considered a traitor by those Poles whose nest egg were disrupted by the communist system's collapse. Make no mistake, in every country that they were in, including the Soviet Union, the communist leadership was sucking the place dry. Okay? So this, you know, sharing with the people and all that is just garbage. Uh, everybody understood this. Those people who led the military, who led the economic forums, who ran the newspapers, all, they were all swept out when the Polish government, when, the com when communism collapsed in Eastern Europe. So they consider Poland, they consider to this day, they consider Kuklinski a traitor. He's a traitor, a traitor. The traitor's uniform. No, 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 no. The other group, obviously, who comes to power, who suits solidarity, labor leaders, all these people, politicians, he's a great hero. You know, obviously, he pushed Soviets out. And if you want a history of animosity, you can pick up any book written over the last 500 years about Poles and Russians. And, <laughs> Uh, they, they were happy, happy, happy to see the Russians go, 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 and which they did. But then it turns out there was a third group, third group in the middle. They were ambivalent. Why were they ambivalent? Well, they'd say things like, well, it's inappropriate to the, to the uniform regardless of his motivation. No, no, no. That happens. I can understand it. But, you know, really what's going on, really what's going on is this. You and I and he, we're all members of this general staff. Okay. You've been promoted now. <laughs> I hope you're happy. I'll leave you up. So, yes, sir. So, so we, we get together every Friday night or once a month in my basement or your basement or your basement, and we drink vodka, a lot of vodka, and we bitch about things. And we talk about wine, women's song, and the goddamn Soviets, because we're all general staff officers and we got the Soviets in our face every day. And we're not happy. And these are the guys that he was talking about maybe even having a coup with, you know. So he, you know, it was a common thing for the general staff officer to sit around and complain about the Soviets. Now, it turns out one day, you and you and you pick up the newspaper, and here's this Kuklinski. Holy mackerel. He did something about it. He actually did something about it, at risk of his life, obviously. What does that make you and you and you? Sort of looking for a reason why you didn't, you know. And then, uh, you know, nobody wants to end up in the clutches of the KGB, but the fact of the matter is that you didn't do anything, but you supposedly felt the same way he did. So are you a weakling? Are you afraid? Are you, what, did you not really believe that? Uh, it creates a little group in the middle that sort of wants to be ambivalent. Now, uh, a little evolution occurs now, too, because when I first uh, got in with Kuklinski when he was out, the, the structure was probably about 70-30. 70 percent of the Polish population who didn't know all the facts and whatnot considered him possibly to be a traitor or at least have some weak motivation. 30 percent thought undoubtedly he was a, 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 a hero. A movie came out, which I'm going to show you. I'm not going to show you the movie, but a movie came out that the Poles put together called Jack Strong, which was one of his code names. It's a great movie. It really is a good movie. I'm a movie buff. And so this would be a great movie if I had nothing to do with it. 
I was a technical advisor to this thing, along with the case officer. So it's very, very accurate for a movie. I just, I just want to point out that it is on uh, Amazon Prime. It's, it's a super movie. The Russians speak Russian with uh, subtitles. The Poles speak Polish with subtitles. The Americans speak English. You know, speak American. <laughs> Don't it's, on, it's on Netflix also. You can order it. Uh, anyway, uh, they, they do this movie. Shortly after the movie comes out, we get Putin seizing Crimea and things like this. Now, all these young people in Poland, think about it. If they're 20 years old, they don't know anything about Soviet occupation. They never witnessed martial law. They didn't have Soviet tanks running up and down the street and things like that. So for a long time, you know, they were in the throes of good Western European idealism. And so, well, you know, these military guys like Kukinski, you know, we don't need them. Now, go to Poland. It's like they look across the border at the Russians, and there's the Russians looking back across the border at them, and the Polish youth is saying, holy macro, this is what you were talking about. Oh, talk about Cold War? It's that. And there it is. And then you can see it because now the reverse numbers on the polling is 30% think he's a, 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 you know, might have ambivalence about him, 70% think he's a hero. So that works that way. We took him out and we, we went to various places with him to, um, to t <laughs> remember I told you, it takes a while for a person to learn uh, Western ways and Western values. A friend of mine, Jim Simon, and I took him down to meet with a, a, a general, uh, General Gray. He was about to become Commandant of the Marine Corps, Al Gray. Really great guy. Are there any Marines in the room? Oh, good. Can I worry? Because I talk too fast, the Marines are going to I have to tell that joke even if there's no Marines. They'll find out that I said it. But uh, I, we did. We went down to see the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And so we were, we were okay. So, see, they love it. Even if it's a negative reference, as long as it's a reference. That's, that's, that's the, the, the Marine Corps rule. Uh, we took, we took uh, Kuklinski down to meet with Al Gray, who was about to become the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Tremendous guy, up from the ranks. Uh, brilliant, brilliant fellow. Um, the next morning, we were in uh, Norfolk. He was uh, FMF Lant. He was the Fleet Marine Forces Commander in, uh, of Atlantic in, uh, in, uh, in Norfolk. The next morning, my friend Jim and I are awakened by a pounding on our door. No, once again, no suite, two guys, one room, okay? Kuklinski got his own room, he was next door to us. He's banging on the door, pum, 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 pum. Every morning, he'd get up early and then he'd take a walk and buy the Washington Post or do something like that. And so I go to the door and ask Kuklinski, is there something wrong, you know, you know, you never know what's going on. Some Bulgarian with a poison-tipped umbrella or something. <laughs> so he says, look at this. And we looked at the paper. And in the newspaper was the first reference in the open press that a colonel named Kuklinski had, abdicate, had, had left uh, Poland and had taken all the secret material with him. And see, initially, the Poles and the Russians thought that he had uh, basically defected because of solidarity, which people were doing now and then. But later, as they, deepenly, as they deep, uh, deeply went into the case for an investigation, they found out, oh my god, this guy's been doing this for 10 years, Jesus Christ. They couldn't even believe how much it cost them. Okay? Just an incredible amount of security was blown. So anyway, here he is in the newspaper. And Kuklinski is yelling at me. Now he's not, what's this, this, he just, I am secret, no, I am secret. Yes, you're a secret. You're still a secret. So, so the, this reporter, he put in newspaper. He put, he put secret in newspaper. And we said, yeah, we know. He said, so, shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> For non attributional purposes, my friend and I said, mm. <laughs> But now we don't work that way here. You know? He goes, why? In Poland, do we shoot? And that's the problem. <laughs> So we didn't shoot the reporter, and Kuklinski calmed down and became a great citizen, nevertheless. Sir? Did you ever find out who you were going to start? Uh, how did you find out that the Russians find out that you were going to start Yeah, you get the other five bucks. You've got to split it with this lady here. You, sit, you two are sitting close to one another, so each of you get the five bucks set up. <laughs> yes. Yes and no. Let me be perfectly honest with this. Do I know for an absolute fact 
Me personally, no. But my understanding, uh, which makes sense of what happened is this. I slightly misquoted the general when I spoke to you about what he said at the table because I wanted to use it in this format. What he said was, our friends tell us, based on their sources in Rome, that the Americans have possession of the draft martial law plan and that they're in the hands of the Americans at Langley. From our sources in Rome, it turns out after the Soviet Union collapsed, the resident in Rome, which is like the case, the chief of station, he's the chief KGB guy in the country, is called the resident. The resident in Rome gave an, uh, an, uh, an interview to the American press, uh, well, to the press, not to the American, uh, in which he acknowledged that the Soviets had um, uh, agents in the in the Vatican. Uh, the Vatican's this huge bureaucracy. I mean, there's clerks, there's everything. There's you know, there's thousands of people who work in there. So it's it's really not shocking. Uh, but uh, it turns out, you know, that he he then a week later said, you know, I misspoke. We didn't really have anybody in the Vatican. Yeah, <laughs> a little late for that, my friend. Uh, you can't take it back once you've said it. Now the problem is this: uh, who was the pope? <laughs> Polish Pope. Polish Pope. The Polish Pope was in direct communication. This is not a secret. There's no secrets here. The, the, the Polish Pope was in communication with Solidarity and La Polenza. He had a vital interest in seeing the communist system fail. He was aggressively helping Solidarity and other freedom movements in Poland. And as a net result of that, he was almost undoubtedly being briefed by the United States on a fairly frequent basis concerning what we knew about the situation in Poland in exchange for what he knew. Okay? Now, let me make this very, very, very clear. No one, no one I've spoken to, heard of, or anything believes that the Pope gave up this information. Absolutely not. It is entirely possible, however, that a briefer went in, told the Pope, look, you know, things are getting worse. It looks like they're drawing up plans for martial law. That explains why they knew that the plans were in the hands of the Americans, but they didn't know who did it, because there was no information for them to provide that the KGB could pick up. But he did, they did finger the, the Roman source. So the Pope then may have said something within the Curia or, or, or you know, the administration that uh, things are getting worse. And you know, all it takes is one leak, one slip of the tongue, and, and that comes out. And if KGB had an agent in there someplace, he would hear it to the effect that the Americans just told His Holiness that, that you know, there's martial law plans afoot in Poland. And that's all they need, which is all he actually said. So the chances are that it came someplace out of the vast bureaucracy that, that is the Pope, that is the, the Curia and the rest. Okay? Sir? Can you cite a specific thing that we, the United States, did in response to some of this intelligence that the Russians saw and, and, the, and that caused them to change their plans? The closest that I could come to that, you know, if, if it was a movie, something would, you know, there'd be, you know, item A comes in, item B is the reaction, item C, you know, is, is the net result, you know. It doesn't really work that way because weapons like tomahawks take a long time to build. They take a long time to buy. But what happens is, over time, you do get a situation in which um, the argument for a tomahawk is vastly strengthened. You know, or uh, in the case, the one that pops to mind for me is that the Soviets, uh, in, in that period of time, developed something called the OMG, an Operational Maneuver Group. The Operational Maneuver Group was an attempt by the Soviets to be a lot more flexible with the use of their armor and their uh, motorized infantry, mechanized infantry. Um, we immediately began to make changes in Heidelberg at U.S. Army Europe to counter the effects of a Operational Maneuver Group structure of the Soviets. So that would be an example. So it would be something like that. But even that, it's not like the next day something happened. It, it, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, this could be a problem. Let's study the problem. And you study the problem and say, oh yeah, this is real. If it's real, what can we do about it? Do we have the sources, the resources? Here's what we have on hand. Here's what we're going to have to order. You know, it's, you know it's, it's an evolving. I don't want to mislead you into thinking, you know, all of a sudden there was this eureka moment 
where this came in and that was done. The closest that I could give you to that is the martial law plan, which we were reacting to on a daily basis, and, and demarching the Soviets upon, you know, when we found out about it. And the other one uh, would be uh, um, the, uh, uh, I just lost it. There, there was another possibility uh, that, that we would make a change. But um, it doesn't happen overnight. I want to show you a couple of pictures, yeah. okay, because I know you're, you want to use this or you want Yeah, I can use it if you show yeah, yeah. me which button to press. Just the down button. Technologically challenged. <laughs> the brown button? Down. 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 Oh, down. Got it. <laughs> there you go. This is uh, Kuklinski's ID card. Uh, nice looking guy. Not too tall. Uh, very pleasant. Very old school European in his mannerisms. Kiss ladies' hands. Things like that. Oh, one of the things I should tell you is that uh, I read in Wikipedia about Kuklinski, and somebody's planted an article in K Wikipedia. Oh, you know, he really, it, it was all planned by the Soviets. Wow, if it was a plant, then they sure gave up a lot of information because my way and our way of measuring whether or not something is a plant is, is it doing damage to the other side that wouldn't, wouldn't have been done had we not heard of this? And everything that he sent us damaged them one way or the other. Uh, and so the, the idea of a plant is, abs is absurd. Plus, the people who are claiming that it was a plant are the communists who were pushed out of power. So, you know, they kind of best their interest in making this look like a whole hum issue. Come on, baby. There we go. That's him in Saigon. Pardon me? Oh, this is 10, 10, 12 years before he defected. I like this picture. It's something that just make an intelligence officer drool. And this is one of them. This is Kuklinski. This is the chief of the Polish general staff. This is Jaruzelski, the premier of Poland. And we got our guy handing the papers to sign. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> this may be a little bit better than that. Here's Kuklinski handing the papers to Marshal Kulikov, who was the commander of the Warsaw Pact, basically the Supreme Allied Commander Europe equivalent. This is uh, uh, Marshal Gretschko, who was his deputy. These are Polish officers on either side. And there's, Kulik and there's Kuklinski handing them the papers to sign. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> This is Marshal Ustinov, who is the, basically the equivalent of the Secretary of Defense. This is Marshal Akramayev, who is about to become the Chief of the Soviet General Staff, equivalent to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Here's our guy Kuklinski handing him the papers to sign. It does not get any better than that. <laughs> this is Dave Forden. Dave Forden is the case officer who handled this case. He was, um, he, he and I went to Poland, uh, oh, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. And he took me on a little trip around the city, a case officer's guide to Poland. Uh, but he, this is the man who actually had contact with the re on a regular basis with Colonel Kuklinski. Yes, sir. Was he the only case officer? No, but what's interesting is, uh, and this is something you want to read the book to get out, the relationship between a really committed agent and a committed case officer becomes very deep and very close, extremely brotherly, okay? And so at a certain point, they decided to put another case agent in because Forden had been there long enough. They wound up forging letters from Forden to send to Kuklinski. Kuklinski could tell that they were forged, and so they wound up getting the letters back from, we had Forden writing letters to Kuklinski because he could tell just by the syntax that he was getting it right. Yes, sir? Did any of these general chiefs make any comments after uh, Kuklinski was... Now, most of them are just pissed off and quiet. You mean Those, the Polish chief? Yeah. yeah. Those, uh, Kulikov, I'll right, give you another one. I'll give you another one. Kulikov, huh? Yeah. If, if Kulikov have... said, Kulikov, okay, I got to finish the yeah. answer to this. Kulikov was met at a conference by Brzezinski. And one of the things that, uh, uh, here's another example, sir. The uh, um, martial law, not martial law, Kuklinski gave us the plans for something called Albatross, which was a system. Of, of, of bunkers that were being built in Eastern Europe to protect the Soviet uh, and, and parts of the Warsaw Pact general staffs and whatnot. Uh, we had those bunkers triangulated, I mean, you know, with 32-digit coordinates and stuff like that. 
And Kulikov, who was a bully, Kulikov, the man in that other photograph, was a natural, physical bully. He was a, a bad man. And, you know, there's communists and guys you want to be, you know, like Akramayev and Hussein, but this guy was a bad man. And uh, he was boasting to Brzezinski at this conference that, ah, you know, we fed you this dirt from Kulikov, Kulinsky, and uh, none of it was any, of any value at all. And Brzezinski told me, uh, I heard him say this, uh, he said, yeah, he said, but then I turned to him, Marshal, I said, Marshal, that may be, but you need to know that within 30 seconds of the beginning of a war, you and your staff would have been incinerated. And he said, Kulikov just walked away, didn't, didn't say a word, because it was true. He was done. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, folks, we are uh, trying to film this, so if, if you have a question, uh, Eris is happy to take questions, but please uh, let us use the mic. Okay, uh, let, let me show you the rest of these pictures. This is uh, Kuklinski's home in Warsaw. The only thing that's different about it now is it's been extended. This part here is an extension. Before it was just a, a balcony and, a, and an open house there. That's the lamppost. <laughs> right there. And the way I got that is Ford and took me around and said, that's the lamppost. So if it's not, it's his fault, but I think it is. This is Kuklinski. This is Les Griggs, who was a U.S. attaché in Poland and spoke Polish, and I hired him when he retired to join the CIA and worked directly on a daily basis with Kuklinski, doing reporting that uh, Kuklinski was able to provide us even after he had left. And this is a case officer from the CIA. This is uh, Kuklinski and I uh, in the San Juan Islands off uh, Seattle. We were looking for property up there for him to move in. That's him on his boat. He called himself the Polish Viking. Like I told you, he was a great sailor. He loved to sail. First thing he bought when he came to the United States, and when he came to the United States, he did get paid. Right? So he bought himself this boat. I helped him sail the boat to New York, and this is one of my favorite photographs of Kuklinski looking at the Statue of Liberty. This is Kuklinski's funeral. Obviously, the funeral of a hero. That's his gravesite. His gravesite's a corner plot on a special in a special cemetery that's reserved for heroes of Poland. And in fact, uh, three months ago, uh, posthumously, obviously, he was promoted to general. So it's actually General Kuklinski now. And that's him. Uh, at his, uh, this is near uh, Paradise in uh, in, or in uh, Washington State. I think that's it. Yep. So, you had a couple more for Yes, I'll come out here. Go through the. Yeah, I was wondering, you partially answered the question here, but I was wondering what he did in the United States after he came to the United States, what kind of work he did. And my, another question you mentioned 35,000 documents. Now, was that literally 35,000 different documents, or was that 35,000 pages from the various documents? Documents. 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 Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. I did not count them. No, no, I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, I, you know, that's the number that I that I get is thirty-five thousand, and it's documents, not pages. Mm -hmm. So ten did, years. What, what did he do after he? Normally, what happens with people like that is they get their money. You know, they get they get paid a certain amount or whatever, uh, and then they are. Uh, it's like witness protection. They get a new identity and they get a new life and they're moved out someplace and they can use that money to buy a 7-Eleven or a fleet of cabs or a hotel or, you know, they can do whatever they want with it. They can invest uh, depending on the level of education and so on and so forth. Um, no, and, and they lose connection with the CIA and intelligence for good reason. Just like, you know, a mafioso guy does not want to be talking to the FBI every week because he's going to be blown. But in this case, Kuklinski's access was so unique and his perceptions were so unique that rather than resettle him someplace where he would be away from us, we settled him someplace where he would be accessible to us. And that's actually where he became my friend and I got to know him personally a great deal. Because for those years between 1981, when he, 80, 81 when he came out and 2004 when he died, um, I saw a lot of him. 
I mean, I, I, we were, my family were friends of his. We sailed on his boat. He knew my children. I knew his. Uh, everybody knew who everybody was, you know. Um, and uh, he, so he, in effect, he became re-socialized as one of us. And so we had to be mindful of his security because until those death sentences were vacated, uh, it was entirely possible that somebody could, you know, sort of decide to take, his, take something into their own hands and kill him or do something like that. So my responsibilities involved his security, making sure he didn't use the phone. Uh, if he did use the phone, use a secure phone that we could provide. Uh, one time I had to, and his wife called me up and said, you gotta stop him, you gotta stop him. I said, what's the matter? So he's on his way to, there was an IBM store at Tyson's Corner, used to be, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and uh, he said, he's on his way to the IBM store to buy a Polish ball for this electric that you gave him. I said, oh my God. Well, you know, one of the things that if, if you were KGB and you're looking for a Polish defector, one of the things you might be looking for, and you pay somebody 20 bucks and say, hey, if anybody comes in looking for a Polish bowl for this electric, let me know. I mean, it costs nothing. But it, it does work that way. So I had to intercept that. I caught him before he went into the store. And I sent him away and I bought the Polish ball. You know. <laughs> but but uh, so he stayed, he stayed with us and he became, you know, for better or for worse, we became his, his, his new support structure uh, and uh, and all of us that are associated with him are very proud to have done so because he was just such a gentleman and he contributed so much. Sir, ma'am, oh, sorry. What happened to the sons? The, the, sons were, the sons are now the subject of vast conspiracy theories which I don't hold uh, and I'll, I'll tell you what they are. One son was a uh, one son was, hit, was, was uh, killed in an automobile accident in Alexandria. That happens. Uh, the other son, huh, the other son, it, it, when you see him in the movie, he's correctly portrayed. He's, he's sort of like this wild kid, you know? And when he came to the United States, maybe reacting to his father's, you know, having done this to the family and whatnot, for whatever reasons, I don't know. But it's almost as if he made a list of the top 10 most dangerous jobs in the world and then proceeded to work his way through that list. He was a salvage diver in Anchorage, Alaska. I mean, he did all these weird things, but the thing that got him was he and a Polish friend of his, and we knew this, this is not, you know, we stayed in touch with the family. He went and bought a fishing boat that was part of the fleet at Tampa in Florida. And he would fish because his father was a seaman, you know, and he it kind of passed it along to his son. So his son, who was Bobby here in the United States, his son uh, would use this fishing boat and they were making a living fishing off the Tampa, Tampa, uh, off Tampa. I cannot remember the year and I cannot remember the, which holiday it was, but it was either Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve or something like that when the fleet was given a warning by the Coast Guard not to go because there was a big storm in the Gulf and that you know, the Coast Guard gives warnings to the fishing fleets and says, don't, you know, it's not a good time to go fishing and whatnot. He and his Polish buddy decide because of the upcoming holiday, they'd get a jump on the fleet, go out anyway. They were good enough seamen, they thought. Uh, go out anyway and weather the, weather the storm, come back early and have more time with their families for, for, the, for whatever holiday it was, New Year's, Thanksgiving, not that, it could have been Thanksgiving, I don't think so. Um, the next day they found the boat, the rails were swept, the rails were collapsed over, they had been hit by a big wave, both men were gone, the immersion suits were still hung in their places where they were supposed to be, so these guys got swept off the boat. Now, but there's no body. Well, in the United States of America, if there's no body, and there's any, consp any possibility of a conspiracy, it's gonna happen within the first 12 hours. I've gotta tell you, I don't, buy, I don't buy it. And I don't buy it because for this to happen, a Soviet vessel would have to come around Florida, go around the tip of Key West, go into the Gulf of Mexico, which is too shallow for submarines anyway, and then in the middle of a storm, find a wooden fishing boat with two poles on it. Okay. Make a good movie, but it just doesn't work, you know. And, and if somebody was out to, to kill the boys, there are an infinite number of ways to do that so that you could either send a strong message, if that's what you're interested in, or send no message at all because it's, it's, it's very, very obvious. 
And so that's my take on that. And now I'm not an investigator. I'm not the police guys that you know made that judgment. So I'm just being honest with you. But you know, it, it, this is one of those things where conspiracies really sound good until you start to take them apart. And this one's tough. It's, it just doesn't work. Uh, I spent an, an awful, awful evening with Kuklinski the night that Bobby was killed, or, the, or days afterwards, because uh, it was the first time I was ever, in, I, I felt that my life was in danger driving with him, because he was in tears, and he was breaking down, and you needed somebody to talk to, because he felt that it was his fault that the son had been killed. Not because of the spying business, but because he had infused him with this love of the sea, and the sea killed his son. And I, I mean, it was just it was a horrible night. <laughs> but but that it was so it wasn't spying and agents and KGBs and things like that. It was it was the sea, an evil mistress. It was, it was interesting. Yes, sir. Can you talk about? I guess his perception of the historical aspects, or you know, we we well, as time goes by here, that there weren't as many launchers, there wasn't as many of this or that to, that we thought, but we didn't have a lot of intel to, to confirm things. Did he have a feeling? You showed that map of unlike the Germans, the Russians are looking for a break somewhere where they can take over France and the rest of Europe and that this fear factor aspect was there or that he thought things would collapse as they did at some point in regards to what the Russians were capable of, the Soviet Union. Was there anything like that that he described how far they were already stretched out beyond no. where they were or uh, any aspect of He felt He felt basically, he confirmed our thoughts and, and we didn't put it to him in a way of saying, do you confirm this or not? But over, over reading his material over time and whatnot, as I said, he basically felt that the Warsaw Pact in a ground campaign in Central Europe would prevail, mostly because of numbers. Uh, they, the Warsaw Pact, this includes the Soviets, were very, very concerned about technology, and they lived to, according to the God. There's two things that motivate a Soviet military officer, and my bet is, without knowing it for a fact, that it still motivates the Russians now. They are taught, uh, they were brought up in a communist Marxist system, the basis of Marxism is scientific. Is, is scientific. It's not an idle technology it's, or an idle ideology. It's, a te it's an ideology that depends on, on basically quantitative inputs and quantitative outputs and good planning and things like that. So they believed in technology because it's an expression of that. So they had a god that they worshipped called technology. The problem was technology ruled in the West, lived in the West. So, for example, one of the things that we got in Kuklinski's papers when they came out, uh, when, before he came out, was the United States was going to put a couple of billion, Reagan got on TV and said, we're going to put a couple of billion dollars in Star Wars. Nobody knows to this day what the hell Star Wars was supposed to be. I mean, I defy you to tell me, because your opinion is going to be just as good as anybody else's, but there's never been, this is Star Wars, okay? So in the United States, when the president says, well, we got a couple of billion dollars to give to Star Wars, you know, every company in the universe, including Colgate Palmolive, has got a defense branch, you know, because <laughs> they want a piece of the billion dollars, okay? Yeah. So from our perspective, it's like, oh, you know, I hope they come up with something like Teflon or something, you know, something good. And that's the problem. The Russians, though, they say, my God, he's just put 10,000, 10, a, a billion dollar bogey out there. And we know that every company in the universe is going to go get a piece of it. And even if we don't know what they're going to develop, they're going to develop something, and it ain't going to be good for us. So they started to respond to that sort of thing. There was an example of the uh, 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 of a promotional film for a Tomahawk missile. I think it was Northrop Grumman, but I'm not sure. And uh, you should see this film. It's like. It, yeah, these missiles boom right through the window, boom right to the left window, boom into the right pane of the left window, you know, all of this good stuff. The problem was that well, it, it got stolen. It was, it was literally taken, you know, and the, they showed it to the Warsaw Pact defense ministers. And Kuklinski wrote us a report on what happened at that thing. He said they were profoundly depressed <laughs> because, because they saw this missile, shoom, 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 you know, 100% at, you know, PK, probability of kill. And they figured, because this is their mentality, that if this is what the film shows, it must be better. 
because that's their way of doing it, okay? If, if we're gonna be willing to put up a promo film, we're gonna hold back on the really good stuff. Now, anybody who lives in the United States, and God help us, you know, contractors probably in this room, <laughs> knows that the film don't mean crap. You know? And in fact, when they made that film, they had to hit the Pacific Ocean with this thing yet. So nobody in this room who's a military guy is going to look at a promo film from General Dynamics and say, oh, I got money for that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a complete reverse perceptions of how things work. But the, they really believed in technology. So for example, their air campaign was going to be one big massive blowout to try and knock out the Air Force in Europe. But it wasn't designed to last for too long because they didn't think they could sustain it. The same thing with ships at sea because both of those uh, issues are driven by the technology in inherent. On the other hand, when it came to the guys on the ground with tanks, they didn't believe we had the right stuff. They just didn't believe it. They thought the tanks were better. They had many, many more of them, and they thought they were better motivated. One of those things. Uh, Sir? Did the CIA give uh, Kuklinski a new name when he came out? Yes. One of the names that he used when he was still in is Jack Strong, which is the name of the movie. He, he also received another legal name, and social security cards, the whole nine months. It's like witness protection, exactly like that. I've, I've got uh, a, a question and a comment, and the comment about cause and effect, they were, somebody asked about what, what immediate effect right. of the information, or you can imagine what the Russians or the Soviets in time realized when Koglinski defected, what were all the documents that he could have seen <laughs> So basically, the Soviets had to reevaluate everything, everything they produced yeah. and had to redo their tactical and strategies because they knew Kuglinski, if he had it in his hands, would probably pass it to the Americans anyhow. Yeah, it, 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 partially true, in my opinion. I, don't, I can't say specifically. I, I guarantee you that I would have loved to have been in the room when they kind of had that awe moment. You know? yeah. Oh my God, this is not a defector, it's an agent. And then they had to go do what you just said. Now, whether that changes everything, though, is debatable. Because sometimes when things are that massive in terms of the penetration, there's nothing you can do about it. And you just have to live with it and make sure you don't make the same mistake, or you evolve the next system to get away from the weakness that's just been exposed. So, for example, we've had Walker and Whitworth uh, you know, blow the whole Navy uh, code system. We didn't throw everything out. We just basically started to update it. So my, my question is, could you characterize the, what quality and quantity of, of intel that you got to see that Kuglinski passed? You know, the quality and quantity of it. Oh, it was, it was uh, every day. Every day. I, get, I was uh, uh, chief of the operations branch, which meant that I was responsible for the, uh, for the Soviet general staff and army level exercises and above. So uh, it, this is precisely what Kuklinski's responsibilities were. So I would get information on all of the upcoming exercises that were being run by the Soviets, what their objectives were, and they were very, very forthcoming. The Soviets were extremely forthcoming in their hot wash-ups. They would, they would uh, you know, really rip apart some of these generals that would make mistakes on the ground. Um, frankly, it's distinct from us until we started getting into using Fort Irwin a lot more. And, uh, and we, we developed a much better system of critiquing ourselves. But up to the point in the early 70s, when I was an active duty officer, um, we weren't very good at it. The Soviets were way ahead on that respect in that regard. Um, that doesn't answer all your question. Well, it's the, the, not only the quantity, but the quality. Quality, quality is, a, is a tough thing to, um, to deal with. Look at it this way. The, um, we used to laugh, we considered the Soviets to be sort of moronic, uh, you know, doctrinaire people, more or less like, you know, as a wind-up soldier, he hits a tree and he banks off, and he comes around this way, he hits another tree and he bangs off, you know. So his, our view of them was very, was very prejudiced. It had to do with the lack of education, uh, the fact that, uh, at least in the 70s when I was on active duty again, the Soviets had to train their soldiers how to drive. Imagine doing that for the United States. You know, you have a special session for driving. You've got to be kidding me. Okay. 
working with a computer game, you know, so their, their whole education system was backwards. On the other hand, there were some things that were going to surprise both sides had they actually gone to war. One, the, when they wrote a war plan, it was like this thick. And I mean, it can turn, you know, every step you're supposed to take as a battalion commander or lieutenant colonel. You know, you're going to go forward 150 steps, and you're going to turn right, you know, and then you're going to go left, and you're going to go 12 paces, and then you're going to fire 30 degrees off the left. I'm making this up, but it was, it's like, it, it was at the point where when we saw their plans, we considered it um, confining and keep telling the commanding officer how to suck eggs, which is the standard Western plan. You know, don't tell me how to suck eggs. Tell me what you want, I'll go get it. You know, tell me what you want me to defend, I'll defend it. Don't give me this crap where I can put three people here, two people there, one program. Yeah. And so we looked at them and considered them to be strangled with their doctrinaire approach to the military. Our war plan for the same thing would be about this thing, and it would basically say, get out there and kick ass. You know, and then and depend upon the individual of the average, individual of the American soldier to make his way through and determine what they're and I'm not making this up up. This is the stuff that's in those plans, you know. So when we looked at them, we saw doctrinaire hidebound. When they looked at us, they saw like you gotta be kidding, that's not a plan, that's a hope. You know, it's not professional. Gen American generals don't go to school. Soviet generals do, did, probably still do. The, the, the education process doesn't end at a certain point where you become godlike, put on a star, and then no longer have to answer to anybody. It, 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 it's a huge difference. I mean, sociologically is what I'm trying to tell you, psychologically. But you have to understand that when, when, when they looked at themselves, they didn't see hidebound doctrinaire. They said, I'm not going to let some precocious 35 year old lieutenant colonel bust his way through this based on his own inclination. I've got a 75-year-old colonel that's been walking that ground, studying that operational plan, and looking at those capabilities for the last 45 goddamn years. I want that guy thinking about what the strategy will be, and this lieutenant colonel should keep his mind on executing the strategy, not thinking up how to make it work. They were in for a big surprise, because they didn't think they were high bound to doctrinaire. They thought they were scientifically measured and capable on a professional level that we were basically blowing off. Of course, we looked at ourselves, and we didn't see ourselves as just sort of like unprofessional la di da We said we train people to express their initiative on the, on the field of battle. And, you know, you can see it with fighter pilots. You can see it with the military, you know, a battalion commander in the American Army is going to do things that a Soviet battalion commander would never consider because the Soviet commander is waiting for orders. Now, we look at that, like I said, and he's hidebound and constrained. No, he's not. He's waiting for a guy that really knows the answer to this in their perception. So what's going to, what was going to happen was a huge surprise. And this is the kind of thing that we talked to Kuklinski about a lot, because while he was still, his head was still over there, we could hit him with questions from over here and begin to parse through the difference of why that was so and what, what the thinking was. It's very, very interesting. It's a fascinating process. All right. I have a couple questions. Sir. Um, regarding the nego the uh, uh, ex uh, what do you call it? <laughs> no, not about the exfiltration, but about negotiating the uh, uh, Kuklinski in Poland being exonerated. Yeah. Um, it, what's the nexus of that? I mean, I can imagine State Department being involved in that, but Probably there were people at the agency which were lobbying for that. Is that how that happened? No. And my other question Brzezinski, really is Brzezinski about happens more. So you got the national security uh, director, uh, basically Polish. So that that's you want to talk about a nexus? That's a nexus. But I, I would point more to Polish to to to, to yeah, Brzezinski than I would to any other source. But I, but I not 100 percent sure. Go ahead. Okay, so my other question really has nothing to do with Kuklinski. Uh -huh. um, it has to do with your reference to Bulgarians with poison-tipped umbrellas. <laughs> was that a reference to the allegation that Bulgarian dissident Georgi Markov was killed that way? It's a joke. Or has this come from some other instance I may not be aware of? It's a joke. <laughs> I, I never said, for the record, I've never seen a Bulgarian with a poison tip. <laughs> And I don't ever expect to for any of you that are in the audience with a poison tip. 
Anybody else got a question? Hey, wait, hang on a second. Yeah. There's, a, there's a serious point to be made there. The serious point to be made was that during the Cold War, during this thing that's on your poster here, there was a kabuki that was played between the intelligence services. And that kabuki did not involve killing other people's people. Uh, there's reason to believe that that may be weakening at this point, especially given the circumstances that would happen to those two people in England. So, so it's, your, your question has a serious import. My two men with the Bulgarian, and it's just a joke. But, but if you're going to study the Cold War and you're going to study the after effects of the Cold War, then one of the things I would look at is whether or not the rules have changed. Because Cold War means dead cold. If it's starting to become not so cold, that's a problem. Eris, you might talk to him about uh, when you were directed to talk to the Washington Post. <laughs> change in your life. <laughs> well, what happened was, uh, you know, when you have access to this kind of information, there's certain things that you just know that you're never going to give up as they yank the last fingernail off and stuff like that. Uh, and this would have been that. It, it, you can't imagine how closely held human information of this kind is, 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 is cared for. It's just, it's in a vault, in a vault, in a vault. And um, um, I got a phone call one day yeah, from the seventh floor. Yeah, everybody's got a seventh floor. And uh, it said, we want you to go to the Office of Public Affairs. You're going to find this reporter there named Ben Weiser. And want you to tell him all about the whole Kuklinski case. Gull. That was his code name here, Gull. What? <laughs> Are you kidding me? It had gone from being the most sensitive thing that I was aware of, or one of two or three most sensitive things I was aware of, to being something I'm going to report to, I'm going to talk to a reporter about with the whole part. The reason was that somebody on the seventh floor, probably with the participation of the director, had decided that Warsaw Pact is gone, the Soviets are gone, from Poland is free, there's a free society, the death sentence has been lifted, all of this is done with, uh, there's no harm, in letting the American people know something that we did and got right. And so I spent a good deal of time with the reporter, which was shocking. I mean, it was just, you have no idea. You, you, you can't believe how hard it is to talk to somebody about stuff when, when you know that it's been the most classic, one of the most classified things you've ever run into. Um, the reporter wrote his first article was for the Washington Post Sunday Magazine, which was very good and was very well received. He petitioned the CIA to come back and for their support to write the book. And the book, the movie I showed you is Jack Strong. The book is called A Secret Life by Benjamin Weiser, who's now a reporter for the Washington, the New York Times. Uh, it's, it is unquestionably the, the best book that's ever been written about the relationship between an agent and his handlers. Not me. I'm in it. For, my wife and I are both in it for like three pages. It's our 15 minutes of Eddie Warhol fame. Uh, yeah, we don't get a plug nickel for the book. <laughs> it's not our book. But the, the book is not about the intelligence analysis. It's about the relationship between the agent and this handler. Somebody asked that question about the letters that get sent back and forth. The level of trust that you got, that's established. That's what the book's about. And so I went in there and talked to him at length about that, and we wrote the book with the CIA's participation. Not approval, but participation. Anybody else got a question? Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you more about Kuklinski's relationship or, or his knowledge or what he had to say about John Paul II. Um, there was that historic visit when he returned for the first time as Pope to the country and like a third of the country came out in the streets to see him. Um, was he giving you any information at that time or what was his reaction? His reaction was he was a, a serious Catholic and I have hanging in my office at home a photograph of him with the Pope signed by him. Beautiful. That's how much he thought of it. it was, it's one of my proudest possessions. And my, my second question, uh, completely unrelated, should Ukraine be in NATO? Should we be having battalions in Baltic states? Are, are you on sort of this, do you, do, you, do you take positions on these things? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not my job, huh? So in the film, Jack Strong, uh, they're standing there looking at the new home he bought. Yeah, and I'm thinking, watching it, yes, it was the same, it looked like yeah, the same home you showed in the picture. I'm standing there watching and thinking, okay, he's not taking money right. from the U.S. government. Did it raise any suspicion 
or was the U.S. government concerned at that time that it might raise suspicions about him? Yes. Because a colonel, even on the general staff, might find that hard to, no, to afford? No, he, he was within his means, but he was on the edge of it. Uh, on the other hand, and there's a scene in the movie that's expressly designed to deal with that question, because the security guy, uh, Putek, comes up to the security general and says, look, the guy just bought a new house, and he's got this Opal car, you know, which was like a big deal at the time. And Putek comes back, and, or the general comes back and says, yeah, but that's what he got all that money in Vietnam for. Apparently, when they went to Vietnam, they were given a huge TDY. And so he saved it all to buy his car. And the house that he was living in was not ostentatiously different than the houses of other colonels about to be generals. In fact, even in the movie, you said you saw the movie, who was his next door neighbor? A major, you know, same house. So it, 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 I, it, the question's valid, and it was a concern of ours, and there were communications that went between the CIA and him, basically telling him to be careful. And at certain occasions, he became so prolific that we actually tried to get him to back off and stop sending stuff. Really crazy. But, but we just thought he was taking too many risks. But, but the, answer is, the answer is he was on the edge of that, but, but he didn't go over it. Anybody else have a question? Yes, there was one here. Could you tell us what is going on today between our government, CIA, and Russia? What's going on where? Between our two countries. No. I, you know, it would be foolish for me to make that statement because my opinion is just the same as anybody's. I'm not professionally involved. Uh, I've I retired in 2003. I've got interests, you know, like any other normal person. But, but uh, you know, for a place like this, on a, on a, a mission like this, to, to make a presentation about an agent and what he did and what he did, it's just, no, no. That's like over beer. <laughs> <laughs> There was a comment made earlier about the things that aren't known. How many Kaczynskis would you guess? Thousands? This is the one we, we are pleased to hear about, but what would you say from the perspective of the timeline and other options that were out there and information that was being provided? At the time? At the time. Nobody liked, nobody liked Kuklinski, because if there was, then I'd be getting it, given my responsibilities. Uh, there's a great book out that I just bought that I got to read, and I'll start within the next day or two called *The Billion Dollar Spy*. It's about a guy named Tolkachev who gave away a lot of Air Force information, um, but it was different than the Kuklinski material because Tolkachev was dealing with the technology of the of the of the airplanes, and we had to answer your question probably hundreds, ultimately, but nobody. Let me show those pictures again because I love those pictures. <laughs> Nobody was leaning over the Minister of Defense and saying, sign it right here. You know? How many of those? And I, I mean, you have no idea how, how hard that is. Imagine, imagine right now, well, I mean, now anybody believe anything, but you know, imagine somebody leaning over the Secretary of Defense's shoulder with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff looking on while this Russian spy is telling them where to sign. Holy crap. You know, we have an allegation of something like that, and it's turned our country upside down. And imagine if it was real. Whew. So, hundreds, I'd say, because otherwise, why are we spending the money on that big building? And don't forget, it's worldwide, too. Um, sir? Was, was the transmission equipment that he used in the movie uh, realistic? Uh, it was big. I thought it was too big. The, the descriptions that I got was about the size of a pack of cigarettes. And this one came out looking like an etch a sketch. Yeah. <laughs> but what are you going to do? And uh, were, were you portrayed as a character no, in, no. in the movie? I'm an analyst. Let me show you what an analyst's role would be like in a movie, okay? I mean, here's Kuklinski racing his car away, the security guys are chasing him, you know, they're burning up Penkovsky in the, in the furnace and whatnot. And here's, here's me show you an analyst. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? It's, it's more exciting than that, but it doesn't show well in the movies. It's on the floor.
Oh, let me show you these things. The CIA actually managed to put out, they put out these booklets. This was on the Warsaw Pact, the Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation. This one's on CIA analysis of Warsaw Pact forces. And this one is on the wartime statute that I mentioned to you. Each of them has a, a disc in the back. So if you ever want to see what classified material looks like, try and get these books from CIA. They come off the internet. And then you can look at these discs and what, you know, these things redacted from them, you know, scrubbed out. But it will show you, you know, the top secret on it and all this sexy stuff. So if you want to see that, they're in these books. Uh, and the books describe, uh, you know, some of the answers to the questions that you've asked about response and things like that. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, how would you describe simply a Cold War? And if you think that the beginning of a civil war is kind of like a Cold War, are we starting a Cold War in the USA? Oh, not answering that question. <laughs> I can't answer that question. If I could answer that question, I wouldn't be doing a brewery, I'd be... <laughs> well, do you think that the beginning of a civil war no. has some similarities with a Cold War? No. No, I think that a civil war in any condition, whether it's in the United States in 1862, or uh, in, in, in Spain in 1937-39, or in China in 1932, 35, 36, 37, whatever, a civil war is often the hottest of wars because everybody is in it for reasons of ideological purity, and there's no giving up. And so civil wars tend to be bloody, big, and largely irresolvable for a long, long time. So I think... What if it's a local cold civil war? I don't even know what that means. Well, it would be like different groups trying to take over each other by different means that are not necessarily with tanks. I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. It's not, not in my job, John. <laughs> You've got to say when. Uh, this isn't Without a question. This. this is a comment to support some of the statements you made. Uh, oh, good. I like those. <laughs> at, at one time, I was, I was working with one of our people who had access to, to the Soviet Union quite a bit, okay, because of his job. And uh, when you were talking about the uh, colonel and, and his guys going out and bringing in stuff, you know. Well, when he would go to the Soviet Union, he would take stuff, okay, mm -hmm. for, for his colleagues. And one of the biggest things that they were requesting from him, believe it or not, was birth control pills. <laughs> and, and, and he said he would literally take them birth control pills, okay, because they didn't trust their own birth control pills. <laughs> uh, and the other thing, uh, he said that when, when they, uh, when Reagan came out with a Star Wars type thing, yeah. he said all his colleagues in the Soviet Union felt just like they were betrayed, you know, because we had kind of reached this parody thing, and they actually believed that we were going to be able to do some of the stuff that, that was, you know. Whatever it is, it's going to be bad for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're right. They're absolutely right. Because yeah. the, I, had a, uh, I had a Soviet uh, uh, foreign affairs person who defected. I spoke to him once. And he said this <laughs> kind of amusing sort of thing. He said, you people are completely, you know, they could do with the Russian acting, totally crazy. You know? Well, what do you mean? He said, we had a situation in which a third, a 15th rate naval power seizes an American ship on the high seas, captures the crew, takes down the flag, seizes the boat, holds the crew as prisoners, and still has the boat, the Pueblo. Yeah. Okay? And what does the United States do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Then a short time later, a, a, a merchant ship in the South China Sea that may or may not be carrying any cargo bound for the United States with not a single American in the crew gets hijacked by some pirates. And the next thing you know, there's a nuclear capable battle group blowing the crap out of an island. And it's, it's a, can you explain this? <laughs> and, and you know what? Because you don't want to give this guy, you know, I, I said, well, you just don't understand. Nobody understands. We don't understand. We can't. You know, I don't know why they would do such a stupid thing. But you see, the Russians have to believe there's a plan. Everything has to be paplani. 
And if it's not put planned, there's something's wrong. Okay? So they're expecting us to be the ultimate planners. <laughs> you know, just one other comment about that sort of thing, the technology. Uh, you know, this guy's telling you about, was in my office one day, and I had one of the, our latest computers at that point in time. And he pointed that out that computer to me, and he says, do you know what your colleagues in the Soviet Union, your equivalents in the Soviet Union, would give for that particular computer? Oh, yeah. He said, they'd give their firstborn for that computer, yeah. you know, because the communist system was just so far behind us technologically that, that it, it was unreal. At the end of the year, every year, the embassy in Moscow would send us a, 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 a cable. And the cable would be their comp all of their jokes that they heard during the year. They would compile them all and put them in. The one that I remember was between Reagan and Brezhnev. And they were compa comparing about technologies. And they were each saying that they had the best technology. And so Brezhnev says, why don't we do this? Why don't we see if we can put in a phone line to hell? And how much it's going to cost and how long it would take. And we'll see the first one to get it, you know, it's got branding rights. Okay, so Reagan goes home. Brezhnev or Gorbachev, whoever, you know, it starts working out. So finally, it works, and, and Reagan is able to make that phone call. The next thing he does is he immediately calls the Soviet Union, and he talks to Gorbachev. And he said, Gorby, he said, I got it. He says, what do you have? He says, I've got a phone call, I've got a phone line, and I can call directly to hell. And he goes, really? He goes, yes. He said, well, how much did it cost you? He said, it cost us $3 billion, but we can make a phone call direct into hell. And so Gorbachev says, eh, it's not bad. He said, but you know, we developed one too. You did? He says, yes. He said, it started working last week. He goes, really? He says, you can call directly into hell? He goes, yes, absolutely. So well, what did it cost you? He said, 52 rubles. He said, how come it's 52 rubles? He said, because from here it's a local call. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll, take, we'll take one more, and then if you have additional questions, then maybe you can do one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> I was just curious about his wife and if she knew what he was doing at the time when they were living in Poland and what happened to her. I love that question. Uh, you know, I've got to tell you, this is one of those truth, you know, tr tr truth moments. Everybody I know associated with this case, including Dave Ford, case officer, and all these people that were associated with it, every one of them believes that she did not know what was going on until he came home that night and said, you know, we're basically, we're moving. <laughs> you know? But I don't believe it. I personally stand out, it's my own humble personal opinion, knowing her and knowing him, that he didn't do anything without her knowing it. Now that doesn't mean on a day-to-day -day basis she followed him around and, you know, understood. But I don't believe for one minute that Hanka, which is what her name was, uh, she's passed away now too, um, I don't believe for a minute that Hanka did not know what he was up to in some general form. I, I, I just won't believe it. And I gotta tell you, like I said, no one agrees with me. So, but, I, but I'm standing here and they're not. So, you know. All right, let's thank Iris for this wonderful presentation.